In this video, we're going to talk about what details of pronunciation of Latin are most necessary for appreciating and properly dealing with poetry. I assume that we already know some of the basics of classical Latin pronunciation, that the letter V is a W, that the letter C is a K, not an S, and that the letter G is a G, not a J in classical Latin pronunciation. We want to go further from that and be able to pronounce vowel and consonant sounds accurately, have a bit of a practice of those details. We want to be able to identify what makes a syllable long and short because quantity is the basis of all rhythm in Latin poetry and in prose as well. We want to be able to place the emphasis, the, uh, the accent on the correct syllable in each word, even though there's longs and shorts going on. And we want to use our knowledge of all of that to scan poetry. Scanning means marking long and short rhythms according to what the rules of poetry are. The text that we're going to look at is the start of the section on Icarus and Daedalus from Ovid's Metamorphoses. So let's start with the pronunciation of vowels. You might notice that this text is marked up with macrons very helpfully. The macrons mark long, naturally long vowels. Ah versus a, e versus e. So let's say them together, contrasting the long and the short. Ah, a, e, e, e. O, O, U, U. These long and short vowels are important in Latin because there are words that are distinguished only by the fact that there is a long or a short vowel. Okido is I fall or I die. Everyone say Okido versus Okido. That means I kill or I slay. So let's contrast the two. Okido. Sorry, I should have made the O long. Okido. And kill is okido. They're the opposite meaning and only distinguished by the letter I being long or short. Another pair is the adjective liber, free, versus liber, book. Liber, free. Liber, book. The quantity of the long vowel should be exactly twice as long as the short vowel. So your long liber should be like a crotchet and liber would be like a quaver. When, uh, when it and when it are also distinguished because of the perfect stem of wenio, it has a long e in the perfect tense. When it, he comes. When it, he came. When it, when it. That's a distinction in tense. And there are more word pairs. There's os, mouth, and os, bone. Those ones are from their uh, nominatives, but in the other forms, they look a little bit different. So we know now that the pronunciation of macrons is going to be important in general in the language, as well as in poetry when we care about what is long and short. We also have some diphthongs in Latin. These are sounds made from the combination of two vowel sounds. I, ow, oi, eu, and ui. These first four are the most important. Let's say the first four again. I, ow, oi, eu. Those ones are the most common ones that you'll find. So these four important diphthongs. Ui, is only found in four words. Huius, huic, cuius, and cui. And those, those are the only words that have that ui as a diphthong. 
counting as one syllable. Any other time that you see UI, it's not going to be a diphthong. Potentially it will be two syllables, ooh, or might be part of like the QU is the ooh bit, in which case you disregard it. Let's have a go at pronouncing consonants where they're single consonants versus double consonants. We're pretty good at consonants in general, but we need to practice how they sound when they're double. Reddit is he comes back. Reddit, he gives back. Let's say it again. Reddit, 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 Reddit. The double consonant makes the preceding syllable take longer to say. So while I say Reddit, it's very short. It's like Reddit. And then Reddit is like boom, boom. And uh, I should introduce, I'll introduce the symbol for long and short. A long syllable is given this long line and a short syllable is given a short line, like, I mean a short uh, little dip thing. Reddit, reddit. There are these verb pairs as well. We were from sum is eramus. And we wonder is erramus. This R, you might want to have a practice at pronouncing. It's nice if you can roll it a bit. The single R is shorter than the double R. So the single R is like r, r, versus the double R, which is r, r. Uh, So the single R could become just a tap as well. R, erramus. Eramus versus the double R. Eramus. It will affect the quantity, the length of time that it takes to say the previous syllable, as any double consonant will. So a single consonant after the short vowel becomes eramus, short. And a double consonant after even a short vowel will make this sound take longer. Eramos. It doesn't cause the vowel to become a long vowel like eramos. It just makes the syllable take longer to say. Another group of words that have very slight differences in pronunciation but that there are important differences in pronunciation is anus year versus anus which is literally the word that we get anus from, and anus, old woman. We're doing this for scientific reasons to show that the pronunciation is important. Let's say the three again, careful with the double consonant. Anus, anus, anus. We wouldn't want to get those mixed up. Some consonants, even though they only take up one letter, are counting as two consonant sounds. X is k, like a C and an S sound. K, s. It counts as two consonants for the for the purposes of working out whether it makes a syllable long. K, s, takes a long time to say. Qua, Q U is grouped together as one consonant. It is a nice glidey sound. Qu. So that counts as one consonant. Do not count the U in the QU group as a vowel. That is part of the one consonant. Qu. H, or H, however you pronounce it in English, is so breathy that it doesn't count as a consonant. It's like, ha. Huh. So since it doesn't it's not strong enough to be a consonant sound. It's counted as zero consonants for the purpose of working out whether it makes something take longer to say. We'll get into working out all of those things in a moment. Now, the ending of a vowel and M is ang. So it's like the word uh, ending in AM doesn't end in um, but in um. 
It's a nasal vowel, and the M is barely heard. Generally, it's only heard if the next word starts with a consonant. So I'm going to very barely pronounce the M, and mostly I'm going to nasalize the A sound. Um versus A. Uh. Um versus A. Uh. We can do the same thing with the other vowels. So starting with um, um, in, in, on, um, this is a, e, i, o, u. I make it a long u because there are no words that end in a short u. So we can contrast the nominative and the accusative this way. Puella versus puella. Colonus versus colonum. The an and un are what the accusative, shape, uh, accusative case should really sound like. And this is going to be important because an doesn't really sound like it ends in a consonant. It sounds like it ends in a vowel sound. Ah, un. It actually sounds a lot like the, um, like, you know, the French words like bon uh, that end in on. It sounds a lot like that, but with all the other vowels as well. Now this is going to happen in real speech as well as poetry. It naturally happens according to the habits of Latin speakers. Elision. It's the removal of a syllable at the end of a word. Any word that ends in a vowel sound followed by a word starting in a vowel sound, we'll remove the last syllable of the first word. Let's give a good example of that here, of a syllable dropping out because of a lesion. Here is atque and ita next to each other, and the Latin speaker wouldn't say atque ita, it's too hard for them to say it that way. They would smooth them together by going at quitta, at quitta. The e in atque is removed. So the vowel sound in the last syllable is removed. And then the word is smushed into the next word and counted like it is one word, at quitta. That's how smoothly it goes to the next syllable. There is debate over whether the vowel sounds may kind of merge together, like atquita, maybe. Uh, there's, uh, I, I don't know where to fall on that, but I would assume that the first vowel sound completely disappears, mainly because it happens that way in English, like don't, we don't say do not, and like very briefly pronounce the do not. Um, it's, and I think just because it seems more in, inconvenient for us, probably that's the right way because uh, if we're trying to make um, a rule that makes it more convenient for us, we might have a different, we might have an agenda there to make it easier. Uh, so I'm going to say that the last, well, not exactly the last syllable, the last vowel of the of the last syllable the the vowel of the last syllable is what we remove in the first word and this includes words that end in um and um any of those nasalized vowel plus m combinations they sound like words ending in a vowel and if the next word starts in ha, he, he, that breathy sound is not enough to make it uh, like a consonant. It is treated like it starts in a vowel. A, e, i, ha, he, he. They're close enough in sound that the same phenomenon happens. And in our Icarus and Daedalus lines, there isn't a good example of either of those things, but we'll see it more when we get into, say, the Aeneid. Impositast is an interesting example of elision because it's with the... Uh, normally you would get rid of the a, uh, the vowel at the end of the first word, but if the second word is esse or a form of the verb to be, like est, then the e in that word will drop out and the 
first words vowel will will be the dominant one. Impositast. Impositast. You can sort of see why that would be is because est is not it, est is such a common word that it maybe isn't as important as the vowel in the preceding word. Impositast. Here are more examples of elision. Medio kut limite curras. Kut is how that bit is pronounced. Strictum quorionis ensem. And that is que alighting with orionis. Orionis. Actually, I can't pronounce That's a Greek derived word. Orionis. Orionis is the rhythm. And uh, so we know about elision, and I'll help you with elision when we see it the next time, since this is introductory. And now we have all we need to mark long and short syllables with this text from Icarus and Daedalus section. A long syllable may have any of the following. A long vowel sound, such as a vowel that has a macron, or a diphthong. It may also be long if it's followed by two or more consonant sounds. So let's have a go with daedalus. A-E is a diphthong. That's counted as one long vowel sound. Dai. Da. Lus. Well, there's only one consonant after the da, and it's a short vowel A, so that's a short. Lus. Int. Well, there's only one consonant after lus, so that is short and it doesn't have like a long sound on the u. Int, n, t, two consonant sounds, long. Te, re, a. This one, only one consonant sound, so that one goes like that. Re, short. A, ablative a is, oh, I mean not ablative, this is a ad adverb meanwhile interea creten creten has long vowels in it so i can easily identify that long um, que. ng counts as two consonant sounds o uh, like long is going to be a long sound um, que. When M and Q are together like that, that's when the M sound kind of comes in, uh, even though it's um, that's when the M will actually affect the sound, so that will cause it to become a long syllable. Quet is short E and is only followed by one consonant, per. So per is long E, I mean short E as well, followed only by one consonant, perosus. And the last syllable I will mark as short. Some may mark it as long because it ends in a consonant, but let's not do that ourselves. Exilium. Exilium tactus. Well, X counts as a CS sound. So that is two consonants, making X a long syllable. Illi. Exili, these are shorts. L is only one consonant. Illi, not followed by any consonant. Um, tactus. So the, even though these are two consonants from different words, they count as following that um sound. Exilium tactus. So the um is going to be a long sound. It's followed by two consonants. Tak. C, T, two consonants. Tactus, que. S, Q, two consonants. Remember that qua and qua. Don't treat the U in the Q, U group as a vowel because it's qua. It counts as one consonant. Que is a short sound with only one consonant, lo, uh, L. Lo, key, short. Well, ki has a long vowel. Na ta 
this only has one consonant and it's a short vowel. Amore, long and then short. Must be short there. That's only a vowel and it is a short vowel. Klausus has AU as the long and that's because it's a diphthong. I, ow, oi, el. And uh, I'll give you opportunity to scan the, I mean, mark the longs and shorts for the rest and pause the video. Then I'll write out what these should be here. So you've paused the video and now you've unpaused it. Klausus erat pelago terras liket inquit et undas obstruat at tailung kerte patet ibimbus illac omnia possite possite at non possidet a era now this is a Greek word, aera. So this one, uh, you might have accidentally grouped AE together as a diphthong. That's understandable, but this one came from the ancient Greek word for air, which is aera, and it's got the Greek accusative A, which is a short A, aera minos. That's what we should end up with. Now, of now that I've marked all the long and short sounds, I can tell you the rules of accent. If you have a two-syllable word, your accent and emphasis is on the first syllable of that word. So I'll use blue here to distinguish my color here. Creighton. I mark it with that slashy kind of mark with the, the bottom of it originating on top of that vowel. Creighton, Loki, Erat, Liket, Inquit, Undas, Kailum, Kerte, Patet, Illac. I think that's all of it. Minos. That's all of the two syllable words in there. Now it's a little bit more tricky if there's three or more syllables in the word. Our first step is to look at the second last syllable. So I'm going to I'm going to use my top one here. Daidalus is a three syllable word. What's the second last syllable? You count first last, second last, third last. So I'll go second last syllable is da. Is it long or short? If it's long, I would accent that syllable, the second last syllable. If the second last syllable is short, I would accent the third last syllable. So let's see. Is it long or short? Short, da. Short, accent third last syllable. I count back from the end. One, two, three. Daidalus. Daidalus. Uh, what about the word interea? Re is the second last syllable. It is short, as we said here. So I go one, two, three. In terre a. That is accented. Even though that te is a short, it's the third last. It's as far back as it can go. So that's fine. Longumque. Count the que as belonging to the word when you're accenting. I made a blog article on this. Que is the last syllable. Um, uh, gum is the second last and it's a long so I accent that. Pero sus. O like ro is the second last and it is long. I accent the second last. Exilium is that li is the second last syllable. I look at it. It is short, so I accent the third last. Exilium. Now you have a go at doing this with the rest of the 
three or more syllable words, pause this video and unpause it. I'm going to do it right now. Tactusque natalis, natalis amore. Oh, I missed Klausus was a two syllable word. Pelago terras. Did I miss terras? Inquit et undas obstruat. Ibimus omnia possideat. Non possidet aera minus. That's our, that's where the word stress should go in this set of words. It will apply for every native Latin word. So uh, that's how simple it is to accent our Latin words. Now what have I done here is I've divided the groups of syllables into metrical feet. That is like the bars in music. And that's what we're going to do in the next step. We're going to apply our knowledge of longs and shorts to analyzing the rhythm of poetry. Now I'm going to show you an introduction to hexameter, which is the, uh, it's the type of poetry rhythm that is used in epics, such as Ovid's Metamorphoses and Aeneid by Virgil. Here is an example in English of dactylic hexameter. It's called, actually, I'll, I'll say it out loud. Let's give an example first, and it should be rhythmical. Rousing the girl in her sleep in the night from the fear of the bed tick. Large bug clings to the glass on the window and drapery weaves net. Space walks spider on wall with its legs in an orbit. The hermit space probes. Jane thinks with thoughts feed brain. Reach as she grabs stick. This shows all the variety of rhythm you can have within the scheme dactylic hexameter. It's called dactylic because it contains a lot of this type of foot. Long, short, short. That is a dactyl. Bumbidi. Rousing the girl in her. That's a dactyl. Other types of feet of bars with rhythms in it are spondy, which is long, long, bed tick, weaves, net, and a third rhythm which only occurs at the very end, can only be in the last foot, is the trochee, hermit, long, short. These are, this is an example of what would happen if you had the maximum number of dactyls in a line. You had uh, the ancient, most ancient form of dactylic hexameter would be entirely dactyls except for the last foot. Oh, and why is it called hexameter? Because it has six hex foot, uh, six feet. So one, two, three, four, five, six. In foot six, there is a spondy. All the way everywhere else in this line, there is dactyls. The rule that must be adhered to is that the ending of the line has to go bum biddy bum bum. Has to have a rhythm like that. Drapery weaves net. Orbit the hermit. Reach as she grabs stick. Five and six has to go bum biddy bum. The other thing is six could be long, long or long, short. Doesn't really matter to the rhythm. It still goes bum, biddy, bum, bum. And the rest of the line, so four and earlier, could be either dactyls or spondies. 
So an example of the maximum number of spondees is this line. Space, probes, Jane, thinks. That one took a long time to say, and the spondees have a slowness to their rhythm. Whereas the dactyl has a kind of uh, a driving pace, rousing the girl in her sleep in the night. That is fast rhythm, and uh, spondees make it slow rhythm, perhaps uh, mournful or solemn or uh, ominous, slow, whereas dactyls could be fast and uh, light and having the idea of speed or uh, swiftness. I guess I'm saying the same thing a few times. That is the pattern of dactylic hexameter and let us apply it to the lines that we have scanned here. Can we discover that they do in fact fit the rules? I'm, since we've already marked out all the longs and shorts, I'll do it in this way, which is uh, just to group them together what we've already done. I'll have a, a strategy video on how to do things when you don't know all of the longs and shorts. But for now, let's just prove to ourselves this follows dactylic hexameter. Daedalus, that's a dactyl. Intere, that's a dactyl. A, cre, spondi. Ten, long, spondi. Gum, queperosus, that's our ending rhythm. Bum, biddy, bum, bum. And uh, you have a go at dividing these into dactyls and spondies. The last one could be a trochee. And I'll give the answers now. Exilium tactus que loci, natalis amore, clausus errat pelago, terras licet inquit et undas, obstruat at caelum. Certe patet ibimus illac, omnia possideat, non possidet aera minus. What you might notice if you zoom back and see, do the accents align with the first beat of our bars, of our feet? Generally not in the first four bars in these ones. It almost seems deliberate that they don't align with the first beat of the bar. But in the last two, the ending rhythm, bum, biddy, bum, bum, it generally always aligns there. I mean, in about 95% of the time it will. Long gum quepero sus has the accent that I've written in blue aligned with the first beat of each bar, each foot. Natalis amore, inquitet undas ibimus illac aera minus. So that is possibly, in my interpretation, what makes the ending rhythm very distinctive, that it will have an accent on that. And it reminds the reader or the listener, yes, this is poetry. I have the structure of the line. I hear the end of the line. Instead of hearing a rhyme at the end of the line, I hear bum, biddy, bum, bum, to show that, yeah, we got back into the rhythm. Whereas the first part is, uh, there's pretty much always a clash of rhythm and the ictus, that is, I'm sorry, the ictus and the accent. The ictus is the first beat of each foot, and uh, there's pretty much always a clash there, maybe for excitement, uh, possibly because it, it doesn't... Uh, it, it provides contrast from the order of the end two feet. So there's chaos and order. Um, it's hard to tell why. Maybe poets have more than one reason. But uh, that's how accent and the pronunciation and scansion, that is the act of writing up the meter of poetry. That's how they all interact. And I hope that we can have good practice of this coming up.